Hello, this is Jörg Lissmann once again from YouTube channel Jockler66 and we are going to continue the reading of the book Rulers of Evil from F. Tapper Saucy today. Last time I ended the reading in chapter 9 called Securing Confidence uh, on page 92 of the uh, PDF and that is page 69 in the book if you follow the reading and we are dealing of course still with the same subject that was the sta studio ratiorum the studio ratiorum that as you understand it uh, by now i guess really uh, implies everything that has to do that we today associate with media television theater plays hollywood movies or movies from other companies anywhere uh, every movie company is probably <laughs> as evil as Hollywood is anyway. It's all the same. It's all studio ratiorum and we're going to go a little bit deeper into this interesting subject and uh, going to continue now on the page that I just told you, on the second paragraph of the page. Certainly, the most elaborate single Jesuit theatrical event was produced by Gregory the Fifteenth, the first Jesuit pupil to be elected Pope. This was the canonization of Ignatius de Loyola, the climax of Gregory's brief pontificate. He reigned only for three years. Canonization is authorized nowhere in the Bible. Rather, it is a process adapted by the pagan traditions of apotheosis, whereby the priestly college declared a particularly effective model to be a god. And a good example for this apotheosis or de deification is still, as we spoke about, I think it was in chapter 1, uh, subliminal Rome about the deification of George Washington on the ceiling of the um, of the Capitol. So get back to that if you missed that. In Roman Catholicism, the Sacred Congregation of Rites conducts a lengthy inquisition into the works of a deceased candidate. The inquisition can take dozens, even hundreds, of years. The candidate's works are defended before a tribunal of three judges against a quote-unquote devil's advocate. A final judgment is declared by the Pope, who orders the Church to believe that the candidate's soul is in heaven, and to venerate the person with the title of saint. In brackets, the Bible teaches that anyone who hears and does the commandments of Jesus is a saint, without any hierarchical red tape. He or she avoids judgment and goes to heaven immediately upon physical death. Well, brackets closed here, but I'm not that sure that this is right, what Tapa Saucy wrote here, because the dead know nothing. And when you're dead, you sleep, and you do not go immediately to heaven after physical death. So I really have to disagree with what Tapa Saucy says here in this part. Loyola's canonization was celebrated on March 12, 1622, in a ceremony that was, quote, an unprecedented display of ecclesiastical pomp, pageantry, and extravagance, unquote. One eyewitness described the event as an, quote, an expression of the reborn spirit of the Catholic Church of the triumph of the Blessed Virgin over Luther and Calvin. Riding the crest of humanist exuberance following Loyola's canonization, Jesuit priest Athanasius Kircher (1602–1680) contributed powerfully to Jesuit theatre as sensory experience. With his megaphone, which enabled the voice of one to reach thousands, Kircher invented broadcasting. He also fathered a modern camera theory with his perfection of the Lanterna Magica. The magic lantern projected sharp images through a lens upon a screen, giving audiences the illusion of burning cities and conflagration, conflagrations. Kircher's work influenced the creation of the Phinakistoscope in 1832, the Zoetrope in 1860, the Kinematoscope in 1861, the Kineograph in 1868, the Praxinoscope in 1877, and finally, Thomas Elva Edison's kinotograph for filming action to be projected onto a screen through his kinostoscope in 1894. Edison had a pet name, 
for the Tart Papered Studio in West Orange, New Jersey, where all his prototypical films were made. He called it Black Mariah, a term that aptly described the image to whom Inigo de Loyola dedicated his life in 1522, the Black Madonna of Montserrat. The American cinema's earliest subject matter to capture the popular imagination, the cowboy, was a Jesuit contribution as well. Eusebio Caino, whose statue is one of the two representing Arizona in the U.S. Capitol building, was a Jesuit professor from Ingolstadt College in Bavaria. And now I have to stop a little, another second. He was a Jesuit professor from Ingolstadt College in Bavaria that uh, also to a lot of people is known as the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria, where Adam Weishaupt founded the Illuminati in May 1776. Something always really comes back in all these books. If something bad comes out of Germany, it comes out of the South. It comes out of Bavaria most of the times. I can't help, but that's just a fact. The Nazis were founded there. Hitler was an Austrian, not a German, but that also is in, in the south of Germany. Always when something like this comes, it comes, or oh, very often it comes from the south of Germany. It comes from Bavaria in this case. It's really, Bavaria is a place that you have to understand where the Protestant movement never could hold foot on the ground. Never. From the beginning on. And uh, in the end of the 16th century, you were even in Bavaria still uh, punished if you owned a Bible. The Bible was forbidden to read there. And by punishment, you can look into the Inquisition how they punished people who have a Bible when they are not allowed to have one. But okay, I'm going to continue now. I'm not Bavaria bashing, I'm just telling this point, this is absolutely true, that most of these things come out of Bavaria. Between 1687 and 1711, Kaino introduced cattle and their management to southern Arizona. For this, is, he is gratefully remembered as father of the cattle business. Pondering the works of Kircher and Kaino, we come to a rather astonishing awareness. Kaino's cowboys, as projected through Kircher's magic lantern, indoctrinated America's earliest movie audiences with the underlying message of Jesuit theater and Roman Catholic theology that knowing and obeying scripture is not necessary in comprehending the ways of God and evil or in doing justice under natural law. Using cinema and ratio to unite Catholic laypersons with the Roman hierarchy was a main purpose of the Catholic action. Catholic action was inaugurated in 1922 by Pius XI, whose two confessors, Father Aliciardi and Celebrano, were Jesuits. The first pope to install a radio station at the Vatican in 1931 and to establish national film review offices in 1922, Pius XI ordered Catholics into politics. In the letter Peculari Quadam, meaning containing the flock, he warned that, quote, the men of Catholic action would fail in their duty if, as opportunity allows it, they did not try to direct the policies of their own province and, their own, uh, and of their own country." Unquote. The men of Catholic action did try. Their first major effort was to employ Black Pope Vladimir Ledokoki's strategy of bringing the Catholic nation of a Central and Eastern European together into a pan-German federation. To head the federation, Ledokowski required a charismatic leader charged with subduing the communistic Soviet Union on the east, protestant Prussia, protestant Great Britain and republican France on the west. Ledokowski chose the, uh, chose the Catholic militarist Adolf Hitler, who told Bishop Bernand of Osnabrück in 1936 that, quote, there was no fundamental difference between National Socialism and the Catholic Church. Had not the Church, he argued, looked on Jews as parasites and shut them in ghettos? I am only doing, he boasted, what the Church has done for 1500 years, only more effectively. Being a Catholic himself, 
he told Bur Burning he admired and wanted to promote Christianity. Now I gotta make a little amendment here on what uh, Hitler said here right now and um, to explain to you uh, from a source that is called Civilta Catholica and you can look that up that is the house organ of the Jesuits it's an uh, original and open uh, Catholic paper to be published Civilta Catholica and there it states quote fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome so when you know that there's absolutely no question no doubt why why they choose Hitler and why they choose fascism in Germany to go opposed to the communism that was set up by the same Jesuits over there in Russia at that time. So they have had their right-left paradigm, could divide the people up, put them in different camps and then let them go fight each other. That's what they're all about. To go into nations who enjoy peace and make them go have war against each other. To promote Christianity as taught by, the Roman, by Roman Catholicism, Hitler appointed Leni Riefenstahl to create the greatest fascist films ever produced. Her deification of Hitler and romanticization of uh, uh, autocracy in spectacles like Triumph of the Will are, in themselves, the history of German cinema in the 30s and early 40s. In print, Ledokowski's pan-German manifesto took the form of Hitler's autobiographical Mein Kampf, or My Struggle in English, ghost written by the Jesuit father Stempfler and placed beside the Bible on the altars of German churches. So there's probably a lot of people who have not known that yet that Mein Kampf was not originally written by Adolf Hitler. Here you have it mentioned in Tupper Saucy and of course he has a source for this. I do not look that source up right now because then I have to go to the back of the of the book. But uh, you can look that up for yourselves and uh, look at this for yourselves. But it's, it's the same like we already talked about, about Shakespeare and all that stuff. Uh, these people didn't write the works they, write, they wrote. They were only actors, very good actors. Like also uh, Hitler was just an actor. To force the agenda of the Roman Catholic Church, to force the agenda of occultism on his people and by that misleading the people and leaving them into the ditch the same thing or into the abyss if you like that word more the same thing the Pope does and uh, his book that he so-called wrote in the time that he was uh, in Stadelheim I think was the prison he was imprisoned in Munich after the revolt and he got caught and he had to sit there for a time and it is said that he ran, then wrote the book My Kampf. This is not right because this book was written by Jesuit father Stempfle. S-T-A-E-M-P-F-L-E. -E. Okay, after World War II, during September 1957, Pope John XXIII gave Jesuit theater even broader horizons with his encyclical Miranda Prorus, Prosus, sorry, Prosus, or meaning looking ahead, saying, quote, Men must be brought into closer communion with one another. They must become socially minded. These technical arts, cinema, sound broadcasting and television, can, can achieve this aim far more easily than the printed word, italics mine. The Catholic Church is keenly desirous that these means be converted to the spreading and advancement of everything that can be truly called good. Embracing, as she does, the whole of human society within the orbit of her divinely appointed mission, she is directly concerned with the fostering of civilization among all peoples. End quote. To Catholic film producers and directors, Miranda Prorsus delivered quote, a paternal injunction not to allow films to be made which are at variance with the faith and Christian moral standard. Should this happen? which God forbid, then it is for the bishops to rebuke them and, if necessary, to impose upon them appropriate sanctions. John XXIII urged that Pius XI's national film reviewing offices quote, 
be entrusted to men who are experienced in cinema, sound broadcasting and television under the guidance of a priest specially chosen by the bishops. At the same time, we urge that the faithful and particularly those who are militant in the cause of Catholic action, means pro Jesuits and their protégés, are suitable instructed suitably sorry are suitably instructed so that they may appreciate the need for giving to these offices their willing united and effective support in 1964 pope paul vi amplified miranda prosus with the decree inter mirifica meaning among the wonders saying quote, it is the church's birth birthright to use and own the press the cinema radio, television, and others of a like nature, Paul cited. Now, when we take the words spoken by Paul VI in 1964, saying it is the Church's birthright to use and own the press, the cinema, radio, television, and others of a like nature, like you could today, of course, uh, mention the Internet, all these things, all these weapons of mind destruction and of um, indoctrination and not open informing, all these weapons the Roman Catholic Church used because the Pope said it. No, also because the Jesuits invented them. They have the, let's say it, uh, let's call it that way, the copyright on all these uh, different uh, weapons that they use to indoctrinate us and to tell us a story that they want us to believe and that is not, is not the real story as far as you understand it right now. So when we go into today, oh, uh, first of all we go, we go back, I think, um, no I didn't mention that in, in, in Rulers of Evil, I had a broadcast some time ago where <coughs> I was speaking about a few things that were said about cinema. So that was something that I uh, talked about in, an, uh, in another broadcast, but I'm going to repeat it right here, because it absolutely has to do with the thing we are talking about here. Quote, Daryl F. Zenak and Joseph Schneck, Schenk, sorry, uh, the founders of the Hollywood movie studio 20th Century Fox, got their business established in 1930 with a $3 million loan from Bank of America, which was formerly known as the Bank of Italy supposedly founded by Amadeo Pietro Giannini, the son of Italian immigrants, but generally considered to be owned by the Jesuits and the Vatican. This assertion, that the finance for the movie industry's most successful studio came from a Jesuit Vatican-controlled bank, is supported by the movies they made, which were designed to socially engineer the American public by exalting Catholicism and the and denigrating American and Christian principles. Now, if you think it's interesting, uh, you can look, of course, my other broadcast up. I don't know where that was, uh, but f otherwise, I go into there some uh, some later, or I put it here in the in the chat box in a comment. If you want me to, then just ask me to, and I I will look that up and and give that to you. But. Here you see that Daryl F. Zenak and Joseph Schenk, uh, F. Daryl F. Zenak from the name, I would even think that he is probably a Jew from the name, and, and that is what the Jesuits always do. They put Jews in the place where they don't want to stand. They don't want you to see it, that it's them. They put Jews out to run these companies, they put Jews out to produce these movies and all that stuff, and then you go out there and you blame the Jews and you don't understand that we are living in the times of the Gentiles and the, you, the Jews are only misused. Like, like all the other people are misused. Because everybody who is not used by God is used by the devil. And you have to open up yourself to be used by a God. So this Zenak and Schenk founded uh, 20th Century Fox. And I think that was an interesting point to mention here today in the reading of Rulers of Evil. But uh, now I will continue reading as far as I see where I have uh, taken, uh, where I have left off. So continue reading. In 1964, Pope Paul VI amplified Miranda Prosus with the decree inter mirifica among the wonders, saying it is the church's birthright to use and own the press, the cinema, 
radio, television and others of a like nature. So don't forget the internet in there. A special responsibility for the proper use of the means of social communication which rests on journalists, writers, actors, designers, producers, exhibitors, distributors, operators, sellers, critics, all those in a word who are involved in the making and transmission of communications in any way whatever. They have power to direct mankind along a good path or an evil path, by the information they impart and the pressure they exert. It will be for them to regulate the economic, political and artistic values in a way that will not conflict with the common good. The quality of entertainment's content was decreed in a section of Inter Mirifica encouraging the chronicling, the description of uh, or the representation of moral evil, which can, with the help of the means of social communication and with suitable dramatization, lead to a deeper knowledge and analysis of man and to a manifestation of the true and the good in all this their splendor. Unquote. Embold, em, oh, that's sorry. That was a little difficult word for me. <laughs> Emboldened by the pap papal decree, social communicators since 1965 have pushed the constitutional guarantees of free speech to the limit by chronicling, describing, and representing moral evil with such progressively vivid, repulsive, prurient yet often appealing detail, that entertainment has become, in the opinion of many, a, variet a veritable technological how-to of moral evil. It clearly does not lead audiences to a deeper appreciation of Holy Scripture. This fact identifies entertainment today as a successful Jesuit theatrical mission. During its four centuries of existence, the Jesuit educational theatrical enterprise has produced a proud, poised and imaginative graduate. He or she is enlightened by the Medici Library's humanities, facile in worldly matters, moved by theatrical, theatricality and indifferent toward Holy Scripture. Producing Jesuitic graduates that has become the aim of modern public education despite the heavy price of ignoring scripture, which, as Luther warned and the Columbine murders attest, has indeed turned the public schools into quote-unquote widening gates of hell. Jesuit theater and the spiritual exercises whose original purpose was to bring human understanding into papal subservience through esoteric emotional experiences have evolved into the full panoply of contemporary social communication. The great objective of obscuring scripture has operated to discourage the formal study of the basics of which the Bible is the cornerstone, literature, science and history. Research by the National Associations of Scholars, the NAS of, U uh, of United States News and World Reports annual listing of America's best colleges including both private and public, disclosed startling figures. In 1914, nearly all of these institutions had required courses in English composition. By 1964, the figure was eight point, uh, 86%. In 1996, the time of the publishing of this book, 36%. In 1914, 82% of the best colleges and universities had traditional mathematics requirements. By 1964, only three, uh, 36% did, 1996, 12%. In 1914, 1939 and 1964, more than 70% of the institutions required at least one course in the natural sciences. That figure fell to 34% in 1996. Literature courses were required at 75% of the institutions in 1914 and at 50% in 1939 and 1964. Today, not one of the best institutions has a literature requirement. 
Most colleges today are turning out graduates who have studied little or no history. In 1914, 90% of America's elite colleges required history. In 1939 and 1964, more than 50% did. By 1996, only one of the 50 best schools offered a required history course. The day is approaching, perhaps, when the only historians will be amateurs who study history as self-help, who examine the past in order to make sense of the present and not to be caught unprepared by the future. So here, of course, I have to uh, deviate a little bit from reading the book right now and make something very, very clear to you. The numbers that are published here by Tapa Saucy in the book Rulers of Evil go back to an official statistic from the, from the National Association of Scholars of the U.S. News and World Report's annual listing of America's best colleges. So when you doubt the numbers mentioned here, you can look that up for yourself. But a point that is much more interesting to understand is he takes the year 1914, for example, and speaking about required history courses. And there he said it was 90% of America's elite colleges that required history in 1914. In 1939, there were already less. And in 1964, it was only more than 50%, so about half of what it was in 1914. But the point that I want to make and I, wa I want to have your attention on is, in 1914 he takes numbers and in 1939 he takes numbers. And between those two dates lie exactly 25 years. Between 1939 and 1964 again lies 25 years. So he is talking about the time of two generations. Because a human generation is estimated for about 25 years. So when you have a change in the policy of what you are teaching in America's elite colleges on history in 1914, and within two generations you diminish this to almost 50% of that before, and in 1996 you almost abolished it because there's only one school that has a required history course in 1996, then you can see what happened within just four, not even four, three and a half generations. A little more than three generations. From 90% required history course, you have one in 50 schools. And this is within three generations. So where shall all these people get their heritage from? Where shall they get their culture from when they are not taught their history? The history of a country is the backbone of the country. And you can only be a patriot, and I don't mean that necessarily for Americans only, but patriots are all over the world. But you can only be a patriot of your country when you know your country. But how can you know your country when, as you see in this wonderful example here of rulers of evil, how the history teaching has been taken out of the school. And while we all go through the school system, nobody escapes this indoctrination or leaving out of knowledge. Because you know it is not always what they say. It is much more in the sense important what they do not say, what they leave out. So I can have a discussion with someone who is 20 years, I'm 49, and I can have a discussion with him on history, and we don't have the same background. And I can have a discussion with someone who is 70 years, and I don't have the same background. And when I'm talking to someone who is 30, and he talks with someone who is 12, 13 years old, he, he doesn't have the same background in history knowledge. You know? So throughout the generations, you always lose a part. So all of you, of course, have heard the expression, history repeats itself. There is nothing new under the sun, and history repeats itself, that is quite right. But how am I to identify what 
of the history will be repeated if I do not even know my history because it is not taught to me. How can I, without a good understanding of the history, understand what is going on today and even make decisions for tomorrow? I simply can't. I have to rely on the people who taught me. And there lies the problem, because they teach what they like to teach. They don't teach what they should teach. And this is why Luther warned that where the scriptures do not reign paramount, then the schools will become wide open skate, gates of hell. So I really want you to take a few moments, maybe after the reading, and consider this, that history is much more important than it's given due. Because from our knowing of the past, we can understand the present and make predictions to the future. And we can't do that when we don't have the real history knowledge. And that is why today the people in the United States of America don't see that they are becoming the Fourth Reich. And we were talking about the First, Second, Third, and uh, Third Reich, like in Germany. And when you then know how many people from intelligence staff, like, Rich, uh, like uh, Reinhard Gehlen, who was uh, the chief of the um, espionage uh, on Russia under Hitler, and he was taken into America and was employed by the CIA and helped even establishing the CIA. So when you do not know facts like these, how can you then understand the way that America is turning today? You probably can't. And it's not your fault. I'm not throwing stones here. But I'm telling you that when you at least, at least hear this right now, I want to give you the message of the importance of study your own history, study your own culture, that you have an identity. Next, of course, to studying the Bible, which is even more important than that. But actually it falls in the same case, because people are not used to read anymore. They don't read books, they don't read documents, they don't read the Bible. And that's where we have to go back to educate ourselves because nobody else is doing it, because nobody else has an interest in educating us, opening our eyes. One has a reason, that is God. So when he comes into your life, open your arms, open your doors wide, welcome him in and welcome the truths that he is giving to you. And then go out in the world and sell it not. The truth is not to be sold. But tell it. You don't have to gain anything from it. Still, I want to go back to that point, 1914, 1939 and 1964. I think you understood that right now, right? It was every time 25 years, a whole generation. So generation by generation, the American people, in this case here from Rulers of Evil, the American people were dumped down in knowing their own culture and knowing their own history just because there were no required history courses in America's elite colleges anymore. Okay, I'm going to continue reading. America's understanding has been systematically bent to the will of the church militant, while the intellectual means for censoring the capture have been disconnected. Most of the content of modern media, whether television, radio, print, film, stage or web, is state-of-the-art Jesuit ratio studiorum. The Jesuit college is no longer just a chartered institution. It has become our entire social environment. The movies, the mall, the school, the home, the mind. Human experience has become a spiritual exercise managed by charismatic spiritual directors who know how to manipulate a democracy's emotions. Logic, perspective, national memory and self-discipline are perched to the point that quote, unbridled emotional responses are 
all we have left, as economist Thomas Sowell put it. Unbridled emotional responses are all we have left. Despite its ascendancy over American life, few Americans understand the term Jesuit. In our next chapter, we shall examine how this term is defined in our basic reference works. These definitions will help us to better understand the kind of character produced by Ignatian psychological technique. Now, on only few Americans understanding the term Jesuit, that is something that can be helped. <laughs> uh, first of all, that can be helped by reading in the next chapter, of course, which I will do in another broadcast. But second of all, it can be done by reading, like I said before, reading and studying. At the moment, with Walt Stickel from GrandDesignExposed.com, we have regularly broadcasts on uh, the platform Hour of the Truth, in which we examine a booklet that Walt has put together that comes from a book written by... Um, what's this guy's name again? Um, by Dr. Ronald Cook. And that was called the Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. We are reading in this and we are also very much going through um, the history of the Jesuits, the Jesuits today, and the perception of the Jesuits. And, will, and this book will tell you much like how or why the name Jesuit in America doesn't have a bad sound to it. When listening to the last nine chapters that I've read of Rulers of Evil now, you will understand the Jesuits are not good persons. They are the minions of Satan who are here to uphold the kingdom of Satan on this earth. And they do that with all the power that is given to them. And the dragon gave them the power. The dragon gave the power to the Antichrist, to the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Pope. And the Pope ordered the help from the Jesuits. So the Jesuits are not a bit better than the Catholics themselves, or let's say, like the, the Catholic hierarchy, like the Pope are themselves. If you do not know who a Jesuit is, then you do not understand this whole thing. And this is the reason for this book, to bring it up. But on the other hand, I invite you also to come to our lectures on uh, Hour of Truth. You can check my videos on that and uh, learn a little bit here and learn a little bit there. And then you will see that uh, why only few Americans understand the term Jesuits. And as Tapasaucy says in the next chapter, we shall examine how this term is defined in our basic reference works. These definitions will help us to better understand the kind of character produced by Ignatian psychological technique. And that's what they do. And from out United States of America, they rule the whole world. At least when you go into movies and all that stuff. So, it's been uh, 39 minutes almost, so I'm not going to continue now with chapter 11, because you know I restrain myself to 45 minutes. This, the, let this broadcast can also go up on Block Talk from my good friend and brother in Christ, Walt Stickel, who will organize that. So I'm going to stop right here at the end of chapter 11 and uh, hope to see you soon back for the reading of chapter 11. In the meantime, I will ask you to be so kind, follow the link that is given to you in the description box of the video, download the book, read it for yourself, not only this book, also other books, and don't only read it for yourself, but share it, share it with your family, share it with your friends, share it with the people who are dear to you, and wake them up. You know, for the world it is already too late, we know what's going to happen, and we know that we can't stop this, but we can make sure that we and other people are not lost, that we are saved by the cross, by the cross that Jesus got himself nailed to 2,000 years ago 
because he knew we were wicked sinners and we needed his love to come to heaven. Accept him as your Savior, spread the news of the Gospel and spread the news of the book of rulers of evil. Time is running out. Please take your time and do that. For the rest I just hope that you enjoyed the reading. I at least did. I hope you come back for the next time. And until then, I wish you a good day. God bless you and bye bye.